On February 4th, news broke that Pope Francis had signed a historic statement with an influential leader of one of the sects of the Saracen religion. Yesterday, I posted the full text of that document here with some commentary, a video which many of you have already viewed by now. The reactions to the statement signed by Pope Francis and Ahmed al Taib have been coming in fast, and they are largely predictable. They illustrate the absolute state of the Catholic media today. But first, I wanted to thank my patrons for their support of this channel. If you want to join them in supporting my work, there are links in the description below, including links to my Patreon and Subscribestar, which is now up and running again. Also, I wanted to repeat my call for submissions for my blog, returntotradition.org. There have been a few articles posted by viewers and supporters like you, so please feel free to submit an article for the blog if you want using the email address in the description. I can't pay for them at this stage of things, but I do want to help get more Catholic voices out there doing this work. I say the absolute state of Catholic media today because the nature of the document should be pretty clear to anyone who reads it. The document is, at best, an endorsement of religious indifferentism. The online Catholic encyclopedia over at newadvent.org defines religious indifferentism as, quote, the term given, in general, to all those theories which, for one reason or another, deny that it is the duty of man to worship God by believing and practicing the one true religion. This religious indifferentism is to be distinguished from political indifferentism which is applied to the policy of a state that treats all the religions within its borders as being on an equal footing before the law of the country. Indifferentism is not to be confounded with religious indifference. The former is primarily a theory disparaging the value of religion. The latter term designates the conduct of those who, whether they do or do not believe in the necessity and utility of religion, do in fact neglect to fulfill its duties." End quote. This document promotes religious indifferentism in the same way that almost everything else in the post-conciliar years have promoted at the very least heterodoxy, by relying on the weak magisterial grounds of the documents itself. Thus, for example, while Laudato Si has no real magisterial weight as a papal encyclical, the language and priorities of this pontificate have clearly given the issues in Laudato Si heavy weight in the church leading ranking prelates to go so far as to extend invitations to speak at the Vatican to noted population control advocates. The same is here. We see various Catholic figures, including Don Goldstein, a professor at some online Catholic university, publicly and widely promoting the, this idea, which has been echoed across the Catholic media world. The passage in question that has caused controversy is this one, quote, the pluralism and the diversity of religions, color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom, through which he created human beings, end quote. The kinds of public figures who will defend literally anything and everything said in this pontificate immediately point to Evan Evangelii Gaudium to justify their view. This passage in particular, a healthy pluralism, one which genuinely respects differences and values them as such, etc., 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 Okay, so let's get this straight. The Catholic Church has, since the time immemorial, said that there is no salvation outside the Church. Period. Full stop. Yes, the Church acknowledges that God can work whatever grace he wants, in particular individuals outside the Church, but the dogma is extra ecclesium nola salis. This has been a controversial dogma lately if you've been watching my videos for very long. How does the statement from this document that God wills other religions to exist not conflict with that dogma? It would be more accurate to say that God permits other religions to exist in that same way that God permits you or I to sin, but God does not will us to sin. Religious indifferentism is a formally condemned proposition. Pope Pius IX condemned religious indifferentism by citing the works of his predecessors. And as an aside, Pope Pius IX began his pontificate as a liberal pope until he saw how crazy things were getting in the church, where he then uh, did a sharp turn to the, if you want to think of it that way, to the theological right. He wrote the syllabus of errors in a, for, in a way that simply states the error as it would be stated by brutally honest adherence to those bad ideas. The syllabus was simply a list of condemned ideas. The syllabus of errors condemns indifferentism in this way. And I quote, Every man is free to embrace and profess the religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider true. He cites allocation maxima quidem from June 9th, 1862. That statement is condemned. 
Man may, in the observance of any religion whatever, find the way of eternal salvation and arrive at eternal salvation. Cited from encyclical Qui Pluribus from November 9, 1846. Again, condemned. Good hope at least is to be entertained of the eternal salvation of all those who are not at all in the true Church of Christ. Is cited from encyclical Quanto Conficiamur, August 10, 1863. Again, a condemned statement. There has been plenty of even moderate mainstream Catholic voices saying that this error is to be read in charity and a sort of hermeneutic of continuity, and to not do so is to commit calumny against the Pope. No, this attitude is how the Church apostatizes. People expect the great apostasy to happen in one dramatic event or turning point in history. That is not what I expect to happen at all. I fully expect it to be done piecemeal, a sort of death by a thousand cuts to the faith. People will lose the faith without even realizing it. Why? Because that's how the revolutionaries since the 1960s have operated. They had two big events at that time period, the Council and then the promulgation of the New Mass at the end of the 60s, and have since implemented their real ideas piecemeal in the aftermath of those events. The most grievous of this coverage isn't the expected cheerleading from the likes of American Magazine, the National Catholic Distorter, or other purveyors of open heterodoxy and modernism, but the strangely quiet coverage by the more neutral voices. It should be news when the Pope promotes a break from Catholic teaching on any topic, but the usual sources, such as EWTN, Catholic News Agency, and others, have barely remarked on the stir this cause among faithful Catholics. Even the Catholic Herald, called recently a Catholic Breitbart by the usual modernists, quoted uncritically Dr. Chad Pecknold, who engaged in what can only be described as mental gymnastics to defend the statement. I'll quote him here so you can understand what I'm referring to. And I quote, in a sense, in sensitive interreligious context, it is fitting for the Holy See to acknowledge that despite serious theological disagreements, Catholics and Muslims have much in common, such as a common belief that human beings are willed by God and his wisdom. The idea that God wills a diversity of color, sex, race, and religion is easily understood, but some may find it puzzling to hear the Vicar of Christ talk about God willing the diversity of religions. It is puzzling and potentially problematic, but in the context of the document, the Holy Father is clearly referring not to the evil of many false religions, but positively refers to the diversity of religions only in the sense that they are evidence of our natural desire to know God. God wills that all men come to know him through the free choice of their will. So it follows that a diversity of religions can be spoken about as permissively willed by God without denying the supernatural good of one true religion. The establishment is, as usual, tripping over itself to defend this. Maybe I'm just being a triumphalist on this score, but the utter blindness to the statement and its defense by people who frankly should know better is remarkable. But I thought I should give the propaganda minister of the Vatican the last word on behalf of the establishment Catholic media. Andrea Tornielli released successive articles heaping praise on the Pope for this document. Tornielli compares Pope Francis to his namesake's visit to the Middle East to spread the gospel to the Sultan al-Malik al-Kamil. Famously, St. Francis of Assisi went to spread the gospel and, by the grace of God, was not murdered by the Saracen tyrant. This is a strange comparison to make since the Pope explicitly did not go to spread the gospel, at least in his meeting with al Taib, and his document strongly implies that it isn't necessary to do so. In an accidentally apt comparison, though, Tornielli does compare this document and visit to John Paul II's rather infamous Assisi meetings, which remain scandalous to Catholics around the world today. There are invocations of religious liberty, another formally condemned proposition in the document. We shouldn't expect much from the official media source of the Vatican, to be sure, but this is distressing all the same. Remember, these types of officials, in both the church and in secular politics, express the policy in question of the organization, as it is meant to be understood by the people in power. This document informally echoes the erroneous endorsement of religious liberty made some 50 years ago at the Council. The age-old teaching of the church remains, error has no rights and enjoys no liberty. All that's missing from the Vatican's response are words like hope and change. But this religious indifferentism is one of the symptoms of the conciliar church and the crisis wrought by the modernists. If the leadership of the church teaches not only the laity, but those objectively outside of her, be they Protestants, the Orthodox, Mohammedans, Jews, or pagans, salvation is found outside of the church through acts of either omission or by a sort of soft heresy, the consequence will be a lukewarmness among the faithful.
What reason have we to burn with the fiery zeal that our Lord asks of us if we believe that those outside the faith can be saved? We have seen a call repeatedly from the authorities in the church rejecting the Great Commission, and instead have said that we are not to evangelize certain groups. Now it appears that the Mohammedans have been added to that list, not explicitly, but functionally. In the end, I'll say this, whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Those were the words of our Lord. In my mind, the most bigoted thing we can do is to deny the people, deny any group of people the gospel. As always, I thank you for listening and for your support. Pray and do acts of penance for the liberation and exaltation of the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Viva Cristo Rey.